I'm very pleased to introduce Andre Copeland. Um, Andre is the Chicago Zoological Society's Interpretive Programs Manager and has been managing interpretation at the Brookfield Zoo for more than 12 years. He also manages the Society's Communities Nature Program, which focuses on addressing community needs while inspiring people to take conservation action. Andre's true passion is arthropods and their connection to our society and cultures around the world. So welcome, Andre. Well, good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? And hopefully I'm not too loud. Sometimes I have a big booming voice. Um, want to let all of you all know that I do work at Brookfield Zoo for the Chicago Zoological Society. However, what I do there isn't as relevant to what I'm going to talk about as who I am. So uncharacteristically, I get to talk a little bit about me and hopefully you all will bear with me because what I'm going to talk about in the beginning is definitely relevant to what we're going to be covering. So as Iris said, my name is Andre, and I was born in 1963 in New Mexico. Army base, hospital, was born premature, and was born with double pneumonia. By the time I was 12 years old, I had been hospitalized 12 times with pneumonia, and I would have to stay in the University of Chicago Hospital in an oxygen tent. My mother couldn't stay there with me. And Throughout my life, I always loved spiders. And when I was working on a project at Brookfield Zoo, somebody asked me, why did I love spiders? Did I love all bugs? And I said, all bugs are cool because spiders eat most of them. But spiders are the awesome ones. And they said, well, why do you love spiders so much? And I remembered a story my mother told me, that one day when she had to leave me and I was crying in the oxygen tent, she said that when she was younger and she was going through some hard times, she was about to go to sleep one night and she looked up at the ceiling and she saw a little spider trying to get from one area to another. It had a lot of struggles, almost fell, climbed back up on its web, but when it made it, my mother said, if that little animal can do it, then I can make it. I can persevere. And she said, and I want you to know that you can do the same thing. So while you're waiting for me, to come back in the morning, watch the ceiling, and see if you can find spiders. And that's how I would spend my time. So it started me on a quest to figure out what animals really meant to people. And in particular, what pollinators meant to people. Why would this woman and her daughter actually take time out of their daily lives to help pollinators if I asked them? Was it because of what pollinators are and what they do? Or because of the fact that pollinators may be important for many different reasons. And more so than many other animals, when you look at pollinators, they are deeply ingrained in who we are. You can actually find pollinators as the foundations of some of the most important historical events throughout the world. Pollinators actually help determine and inspire who we are as a people today, but also they will influence our future, not because of what they are and what they do, but more so because of what these animals actually mean. And so as we go through this today, we're going to hear some stories about pollinators and how they are in everything. Because when you look worldwide, as I said, you can find pollinators as the foundation of a lot of our historical events. But you can also see that pollinators are connected to our economy, significant science, as well as spiritual beliefs, and last, of course, but not least, poetry and art. So as we start this adventure, we want to go way back, and I want to take a look at national security. And if you ever have a chance to read insects as instruments of war, please do. Now, this is one of those stories of when Rome wanted to take over a small community called Heptachimedes in Asia Minor. They sent a thousand troops to take over this little civilization who couldn't possibly defend themselves. So what they did is, along a ravine, they left out caches of honey because they knew the Romans would stop and they would eat them. 
But what the Romans didn't know is the beekeepers of Hecatachmedes knew that honey made from bees who had feasted on rhododendrons and azaleas had toxic alkaloids to humans. So the Romans fell into a sick stupor, and then the small defenses were able to come out and lay waste to a thousand Roman troops. And there are many, many more stories like this of where these animals, because of what they do, helped save civilizations. Now, a very interesting story of revenge involves Princess Olga of Kiev. You see, the Drevelins decided that they wanted to take over her kingdom, and they thought the best way to do that was to go on a peace-seeking mission and invite her husband, Prince Igor, over to their camp, where they promptly killed him. Next part of their plan was, we're going to go by and we're going to swoon the widow. We'll send some ambassadors and try to convince her to marry our prince. Well, of course, she did, wasn't having that, so she buried them alive. Second group came, she burned them in a bathhouse. So finally, third time, they think it's going to be a charm. She says, you know what? I'm going to do it. Let's have a big party. She invited 5,000 of their ambassadors over and gave them a drink called mead, which is made from honey. It's a little bit like beer, but just like Heptachimedes, that mead was made from honey that had the alkaloids from rhododendrons and azaleas. Now, national security can take on many different forms. A lot of times it's economical. So these same flowers that were used for national defense are used in Tokyo for a yearly festival that brings a lot of economy to that community. The Rhododendron Festival that you will see in the Johnston Gardens of the UK does the same thing. People immerse in that beauty. But even more importantly, right now, Recently, in 2014, the White House press secretary sent out an email saying how important pollinators are to our food security. They talked about the number of crops that pollinators actually poll pollinate. 87 of 115 pollinated directly by bees and bringing $15 billion to the economy. And we've often heard about people talking about pollinators being responsible for one in every three bites of food that you eat. Take a look at your breakfast on bees versus without. But I like to go a bit deeper and start to think about this a bit differently. Of course we can think about these animals connected to our food and the things that we eat. However, when we start to think about how honeybees are commercial livestock, and they pollinate 96% of the world's almonds in California every year. I think about that gentleman who's not a beekeeper or this gentleman, doesn't own an almond grove, but drive trucks, forklifts. How important are pollinators to the security of their future? And when you think about economical security, it goes beyond that as well. It's tied to who we are and our ceremonies, such as our expressions of love, Valentine's Day, Sweetest Day, weddings. Florists are now being challenged to take a look at bridal bouquets and tabletop displays differently. They're moving away from the traditional roses and starting to focus on wildflowers such as asters, purple coneflowers, zinnias. And where would these beautiful celebrations be how differently would they mean to us without pollinators? Bridal bouquets, bridesmaids bouquets. But pollinators even play a more direct connection to some of these celebrations. Some weddings now, and more and more it's becoming popular, for them to include butterfly releases to symbolize the metamorphosis from two people living individual lives to becoming one. Now, one couple in China took this to the ultimate extreme. They're beekeepers, and they decided when they took their vows, <laughs> they wanted their bees with them. Hopefully, they didn't take them on the honeymoon. I don't know. <laughs> Might have been a sticky situation there. But as you see, pollinators have a deep, deep meaning and can mean many different things to many different people. And as we take a look, 
in our own lives, in histories, I'd like to think about things such as our literature, our art, our poetry, our movie industry. Whether it's historic, contemporary, or pop culture, what effect has Pollinator had on these artists? So for example, when you take a look in great works of literature, you can find that pollinators have inspired many of the things we may take for granted, such as this quote by Hans Christian Andersen. Just living is not enough, said the butterfly. One must have sunshine, freedom, and a little flower. And that's one of his most popular quotes. However, John Bannister Tabb, who was a priest, and a poet liked pollinators as well. And he wrote a very famous poem that one father looked at and decided he was going to take one stanza of this poem and create a beautiful piece of art for his child's nursery. Now, he didn't go with the second stanza, and I'll tell you why. A flash of harmless lightning, a mist of rainbow dyes, the burnished sunbeams brightening, from flower to flower he flies. That's the first stanza. The second stanza goes on to talk about how the hummingbird drinks from the bosom of a flower. Probably not the best to go in a child's room. So I think that's why he cut it down to the first stanza. But often we don't experience great works of art in their original form. The first time I heard Nikolai Karkov's Flight of the Bumblebee, I heard it through the jazzy Al Hurt version while I was sitting in my living room as a child watching a television show that was born of a radio program that galvanized my love for comics, graphic novels, and superheroes, which is why I go to superhero movies today. So as you watch this next part, think about where our society might be without the inspiration of pollinators and without the creative expression that these artists have brought. movie industry be? A lot of times we're... <laughs> I'm serious. Would Batman be Ratman? I know that my daughters, I grew up with Adam West. My oldest daughter, she loved Michael Keaton. My middle daughter, Christian Bale is the Batman. But that represents times with my family. And sometimes classical art will start to merge with contemporary art and pop culture. I'm excited to see when this is going to become priceless. <laughs> Would we have Bat Mona if we didn't have bats? <laughs> but more seriously, when you think about pollinators, they represent a lot in many different cultures. And especially if you take a look at the Hispanic culture. And we're going to focus in just a bit on one of the reasons we're all here, the monarch butterfly. And when you take a look in the Hispanic culture, the monarch butterfly is called Miraposas Migrantes. And it is said to symbolize the movement of their people, the movement of their people from Central America to the United States in the quest of a better life, more food, better living for their family. And this was very important to an artist named Hector Duarte. Hector Duarte lives in a small community in Mexico that's impoverished. It's called Michicao in Mexico. And what he became concerned about was the fact that people were leaving that community and never coming back. And the people that were staying there were losing pride in the community in which they lived. So he reached out to artists here in the United States, as well as in Canada, asking for their visions of butterflies 
they sent their visions and he engaged the people of the community in a beautification project where they started to paint these butterflies on the sides of their homes, the sides of their businesses, in an effort to bring back the pride they once had in who they are, where they came from, and where they lived. It was an extremely successful project, and he got more art than he really expected. And this is very important to those people because when you look in the Hispanic culture, you can find butterflies in everything. You can find butterflies in their art, in their teachings, in their spiritual beliefs. And as we take a look throughout history and throughout time, we can see that pollinators have played an important role in many spiritual beliefs around the world. For example, if you take a look back at the Mayans, they believed that the honeybee had a lot of spiritual significance. They believed that honeybees could represent the soul and the connection to the underworld. And then when you move on to places as far away as Egypt, there are beautiful stories, such as the one when the sun god Ra wept every tear that hit the sands of the desert transformed into a honeybee. And as you go throughout the world, you will take a look and see that many of these stories are similar. When you look at Anglo-Saxon lore and spirituality, butterflies represent spirit of change and also the soul. Now, a few years back, my sister-in-law lost her battle against breast cancer. And she was my wife's only really remaining close relative. So it hit Kim really, really hard. And Kim and I never really talk about these types of things. You know, she has to put up with me talking about superheroes all the time. So after her sister passed, she said, you know, I want to go for a walk in nature. She really loves nature. And we live out by the Sand Ridge Nature Center, southeastern side, just outside of Chicago, right near the border of Munster, Indiana. It was a dreary, cold day, late October. They have a small butterfly garden there. Flowers were wilting. And the last thing we ever expected to see was a butterfly come in and land. A butterfly came, flew by landed right in front of my wife. And she looked at it, and she said, you know, she, that, she said, that's Carrie, letting me know that everything's going to be OK. First time I'd seen her smile in almost two days. We never talked about this type of lore and the fact that in many cultures, that is a representation and a meaning of the butterfly, that soul of a loved one coming to let you know it's going to be fine. So we depend on pollinators just as they depend upon us. And we can take many steps to help ensure their future. But the one thing I'd like for you to consider is that will people take steps to help these animals because of what they are, what they do, what they're worth economically? Or are they going to do it because of what these animals mean to them? And the reason I say this is because you have the power with your words to determine how you inspire people when you talk to them, to determine how they are going to think about their connection to the pollinators of the world. And when we do that, we will then help determine for our future generations how they see us, the choices they have for the outlets of their creativity, and for their life moving forward. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much, and I really appreciate all of you listening to me. Thanks. Thanks.